and we're live. I think we're live. Hello and welcome to the surprise live stream. Um, I was not planning on doing this, but somebody on Twitter sent me this video and I took a minute to look and skim through it a little bit and I went, oh dear, um, I really want to respond to this. And my goal here is to help people, specifically, honestly, the people I'm trying to help the most here are atheists and skeptics who might possibly be uh, being given wrong information by someone they look up to. And the person I'm talking about here is a CEO, the CEO, Jim Majors, the CEO of a very big atheist group that's an international group. And uh, well, let me allow him to introduce himself to you. So uh, I'll tell you this, um, I don't have any links in my video description yet, but as soon as the stream's over, I'm gonna put a bunch of links there so that you guys can have links to everything I'm talking about, including a link to this original video. It's on the Non Sequitur Show, which is a atheist show. They're not sensitive to, to uh, um, offending people or anything like that. So I want you to know that, but they, um, they had an interview with this guy, Jim Major. So here is what Jim said about himself. I'm allowing Jim to introduce Jim. Oh, let me get my, uh, let me get some headphones going too, so I can hear what he says as well. Uh, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and, uh, let people know who you are and what you do and why you do it, all that good stuff. And then where they can find more and then we'll let you take things away. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Jim Majors, and I'm the CEO of Atheist Republic. Atheist Republic is the world's largest online atheist community. Uh, we're, we're growing every day. We've got just under 2.2 million followers on Facebook, um, and we also have a website, atheistrepublic.com, and uh, we advocate for and on the behalf of atheists from around the world. Uh, we have literally people in every country. All right, so Jim is actually doing this. He, he Now you understand who he is. Uh, the reason why he's on the Non Sequitur Show being interviewed is because he's promoting this book right here. This book, which is actually called Holy Proofreading. That's the subtitle of the book, right? They're correcting Christianity. So he says the title is actually going to be written on the spine of the book with the subtitle on the front. Um, it's not out yet, but it's coming out soon. So I, I think that this, it, it, as I understand it, is an attempt to promote his book, which is fine. You know, you write a book, of course, you go do interviews and you promote your book. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but that's the goal here. So what he's going to do through the interview, he's going to kind of come off the top of his head with uh, a bunch of examples from his book of things that are wrong with Christianity, ways the Bible contradicts itself, um, just basically a bunch of trivia that shows how silly it is to believe the Bible and to be a Christian. And of course, I believe the Bible, I'm a Christian. And um, as I heard Jim getting into the details, I was... Uh, it's embarrassing how bad it is. I just ask this, hear me out, consider what I'm saying. If nothing else, you do not want Jim to be your source as an atheist or as an agnostic. You just, you don't want to learn from this guy and I'm going to show you why. Um, he's just blatantly wrong. But he, at the end of his, his um, stream, he put out a challenge and he asked us to fact check him. And so this is the challenge that I'm taking up. It's the Jim challenge. You know they can go and they can verify any of the claims that I that I that I make in this book. Um, I did my very very best to make sure that this is not uh, this book is not erroneous. That my facts uh, are are legitimate. Uh, they are backed up by uh, by most of them are backed up by uh, by the ma the majority consensus of biblical scholars. Now I do ha make some points in there that I believe are that I believe are true, and I do give my reasoning for that. And uh, and what I believe is is very very good evidence for for that being true. And where can people you, uh, you, you, get you your actually book? do your research? You actually make sure that the facts are correct. You actually do your due diligence and you actually care about things being oh, correct. Yeah. All right. So he says, yeah, like I, I've fact checked. I, I've double checked. Now, I don't think he's trying to lie here. And maybe I'm maybe I'm being gullible. I don't assume people are lying. I try to take him at face value as much as possible. I think that Jim thinks this is solid information. And that's why he's going out and presenting it to this case. Um, but... It's not solid information. So we're going to look at the specifics and I want you to know I'm not bashing Jim just as Jim, actually Jim says it better than anybody else. I'm going to let him say it. This is, this. the goal here is not attacking Jim, not attacking anybody who believes in him, but rather I'm talking about ideas. My theme for many years is I attack ideas. I don't attack people. That's the way I like to put it. Here's how Jim puts it. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not bashing, bashing Christians. Christians. I'm, 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 I'm simply exposing uh, a, a harmful doctrine and harmful belief. Um, but so it, it's, 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 it's belief, not the believer. Uh, kind of like the Christians say, hate the sin and, and not the sinner. It's uh, right. except mine's not a cop out. 
<laughs> Ooh, shots fired. Shots fired. He can't help himself. He just has to take a swipe at Christians. But uh, but I'll, I'll ignore the, the comment for a minute. Really, the deal is this. Is he's like, look, you know, we can do this. We can, we can say... Um, we're disagreeing here, Christians, atheists, but you know, lots of different groups of people. We disagree on big issues. We should talk about those issues. We should be able to say, "Hey, you're wrong," without it being seen as a uh, an attack on a person. And I fully uh, agree with that. So let's get into it. Here's some of the claims that I heard from Jim, and I'm going to deal, deal with them like one at a time. I'm not going to go through the whole video. It was a two-hour video. I just kind of pulled out a bunch that I thought were representative of the fact that Jim is. Uh, uninformed and he's misinforming others. Those are just the facts of what's happening. Uh, the truth about God's word is that it is actually God's word, but uh, but misinformation like this keeps skeptics and atheists from ever even taking seriously Christian claims because they just get caught up in sort of old, outdated, and wrong information. And so here's the first example. It's about the dating of the gospel of John. Listen to what Jim thinks about not only when John is dated, but it, but he just thinks that everybody knows this, right? That John was written really, really late, nowhere near the time of Jesus. So uh, here's what he says. If you, uh, I mean, if, if you look at, look at the Bible, especially the New Testament, it was written over hundreds of years. Like uh, these, um, like while the, the Gospels were written at, at the earliest, uh, very earliest, 40 years after, the, after Jesus supposedly died, uh, which was Mark, um, there's still a hundred or so years span in between that and the time that the, that the last one was written. Okay. I hope you heard what he says there. He says the earliest possible date for Mark is 70 AD, 40 years after the death of Christ. And that John was written at least a hundred years later. That means that John is at least 170 AD or later. Um, he's wrong on both counts here. Um, the, the early dating of Mark would put Mark in the fifties, um, possibly the 60s, um, that would be the early dating of Mark, right? The late dating of Mark is the 70 70s date. That's the more of the... Now, it is the majority view, right? The majority have the late dating of Mark, but but that's not the early date. That's the late date, just to be clear, right? Um, however, is John even potentially 170 AD? Is that the dating of John? No, this is not the case. This is just... Utterly false. So for this, I'll, I'll give you guys some data. Uh, there's a, a scholar named Dan Wallace, who's one of the premier textual critics um, uh, out there doing a lot of work, publishing papers, all that kind of stuff. It, I'm just trying to say, I want to quote a good source here. I'll put a link to his article in the video description as soon as I'm finished, and you can read this article I'm going to quote from. Um, he says, most scholars date this gospel, John's gospel, uh, from around the 90s to 100, and this is after the death of Christ. Um, therefore, uh, excuse me, there is a growing number of scholars, however, who place it sometime before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE, apart from J.A.T. Robinson's radical redating of John to the fifth decade of the first century, a view which, to my knowledge, almost no scholar has found palatable. The vast bulk of New Testament scholars can be put into two camps, 90s or 60s. And so he's not really making a case. He will actually make a case for an early dating of John in this article, which I'll link below. But uh, Dan Wallace right here, he's just saying the two schools of thought are that John was written between either the 90s or the 60s and that this is the debate, right? The majority say this, but there's a sort of a momentum moving towards the minority position, which is in the 60s and earlier authorship of John. Um, that's that's where it is. It's not 170 AD. Now this little this little piece of paper I put up here at the top of the screen, um, it looks like a like a little ink blot or something like that. That actually is called P52. It's a papyrus from the second century. This is one of the things that dismantles the idea that John was written in 170 AD. This is one reason why no scholar thinks this. Like nobody thinks this. I, I don't know of anybody. Maybe there's one kooky dude out there who has a PhD that thinks it, but. Um, but no, it's, it's definitely not the case because P52, small as it is, it's like the size of a credit card. It has on it uh, passages on the front and back. It's written front and back. So it's a codex, which means it's like a book form of a manuscript. And it dates from 100 to 150 AD. That's, that's the date range for it, 100 to 150. And what's on it? Well, the Gospel of John is on it. John 1831, John 1832, and John 1833. So portions from those, those verses. Um, you can't have a piece of the text before the text was written, right? That's like saying you have a photograph of someone before they existed. 
Like this doesn't, this isn't how reality works, you know? So this, according to Dan Wallace, this little, this little P52, really important discovery, um, this overturned centuries of, of scholarship coming out of Europe, uh, that basically was saying that the, that the gospel of John was really late. So I think what's happening here is that Jim's information is just super duper old and he doesn't know anything about what maybe has happened over the past couple, uh, well, past hundred or so years in new Testament, uh, scholarship. And so that's bad on his part. And I'll be honest, like you could spend literally five minutes on Google and find out that this is the case. It's not hard. Now there's other manuscripts as well that I could share, but I just wanted to give an example. Um, for those of you who are who, who are my audience, you're skeptics, you're atheists, and you're like, well, I don't like Dan Wallace. Isn't he a Christian? Well, yeah, he's a Christian. I don't think it affects his scholarship, but he is a Christian. So here's here's another guy. Uh, you know this guy, right? Bart Ehrman. Okay, so Bart Ehrman he dates the Gospel of John to, from 90 to 95 A.D. This is his date for John, and Bart Ehrman, of course, is is about as uh, not Christian as you can get. Okay, <laughs> as far as um, I'm not saying he's a jerk or anything like that. I'm just saying that his his agenda in his books is to dismantle the Christian worldview one book at a time. Like that's that's what he's doing. You know, if you if you're paying attention, so he, even he says, you know, uh, John was written. He takes the late date view, 90 to 95 A.D. So if you're looking for Jim to be your source of information and to tell you about the Bible, and you're you're part, maybe you're on the non sequitur show, um, and you're like, hey, I'm watching the show and. Boy, that's boy. I can't believe those Christians are so stupid. Man, they don't even know their book was written so late. Um, no, that's not true. It's just not true. Um, I think that sometimes skeptics have such a sometimes not every skeptic, not all the time, but sometimes skeptics have such a low bar for accepting information that's against Christianity that they become gullible in their uh, skepticism. And let's be honest, it can happen to Christians too. You can have such a low bar for confirming your Christian beliefs that you don't really vet things. You don't think deeply about it. You just go, oh, that sounds good. I'll take it and run with it. Um, but, you know, we all should we all should be doing some fact checking and thinking about these issues. Now, listen to what he says about Herod. Um, this is interesting. Uh, this is his recount. As we jump into what uh, Jim's saying, he's talking here about Herod and how King Herod, he was the king while Jesus was born, Herod the Great, how the idea that Herod would attack and kill children in uh, Bethlehem is silly because of a couple of arguments that he's going to offer. So let's listen in. And uh, they were shown a vision from God um, of Herod's true plans to to kill uh, the little, little baby Jesus because uh, he, he didn't want him threatening his, his throne, even though uh, he was getting on up in age and the average life expectancy was like 35 years old at the time. Uh, he, he apparently was, was threatened by, by this baby. Okay, so there's two two real claims there. One of them is based on the life expectancy. It's the idea is Herod was old, and therefore, since Herod was going to die soon, uh, this is the implication, that it doesn't even matter. Like, who cares? You know, life expectancy is really short. I don't know. I don't know how that affects Herod, even if the life expectancy was 10 years old. Like, Herod's already much older, and he's alive, and he's healthy, you know, so I'm not really sure what the issue is there. Uh, but... Uh, this is a common claim that life expectancy in the first century was like 30, 35 years. Uh, I don't think that's true. I'm going to do a video on that maybe one of these days. I'll put an article in the description from uh, bbc.com where they actually, I, it was actually a pretty good article considering the, the source. And uh, I, I thought it would be something interesting. It shares arguments from both sides. I'll put that in the video description for you guys if you're interested. But but what he does is he mocks the idea that Herod would be threatened by this baby who's called the king of the Jews. And to this, I just want to say, guys, we actually know a lot about Herod the Great. And here's some of the stuff we know about him. Um, Herod the Great, now there's several Herods, by the way. There's lots of different, it's confusing when you reach, read into the Herods, right? But Herod the Great is probably the most well-known of them, sort of started the dynasty of the Herods. Um, Herod, he, he got suspicious if he heard so much as a rumor that someone was going to challenge his throne. He actually developed a spy network through his own his own communities so that he could guard against them uh, and and kill people basically when they raise their head. Herod, I'll just read this to you. And this is from uh, biblearchaeology.org um, and I'll put a link in the description for that. Um, Herod also had three of his sons killed. This man killed three of his own children. Three. 
three, including his firstborn. The first two, Alexander and Arist Aristobulus, the sons of Mariam, were strangled in Sebast, which is Samaria, in 7 BC. 7 BC, that's right around the same time of Christ's birth. He's killing his own children. Think about it. Um, and buried at uh, Alexandrium. And then the sources are quoted there, the Antiquities of the Jews, that's from Josephus. And then we have the next sentence. The last only five days before Herod's own death was Antipater, who was buried with cere without ceremony at Hyrcania, or Hyrcania. I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. Um, but Herod's own son, he has him killed five days before he dies. He's going to die and he still cares. And he, this is exactly the opposite of what Jim was saying, right? Like, why would Harry care if he's going to die soon? What does he care if somebody else comes to usurp him? He killed his own son a few days before he died without any, any sort of burial. Herod the Great became extremely paranoid during the last four years of his life from 8 to 4 BC. This is, they literally do psychoanalyzing of Herod the Great because they're like, they think, what was wrong with this dude? He would either build something big or kill someone he was feeling threatened by, or he was lying around in depression. That was kind of his routine. Um, on one occasion, in 7 BC, he had 300 military leaders executed. On another, he had a number of Pharisees executed in the same year after it was revealed that they predicted that Feroro, <laughs> Feroro's, that's hard to say, Feroro's wife, Ferorus was uh, Herod's youngest brother and tetrarch of Perea. So his youngest brother's wife, um, predicted the following that by God's decree, Herod's throne would be taken from him, both from himself and his descendants. And the Royal power would fall to her and to Rodas and to any children they might have. The dude kills a group of Pharisees because of a prediction by a family member of his about him losing his throne. So is it hard to think that Herod would, you know, would at least, it would at least be in his character to murder a group of innocents in a small nobody town called Bethlehem? Um, no, it's definitely not hard to, to see that happening. So the next, the next thing I want to share with you is actually uh, Jim's view of Greek. So this, I had to listen to a few times. There, there's a thing in, there's a thing called Koine Greek. Koine, there's different kinds of Greek, right? There's, there's modern Greek. In ancient, in in ancient Rome, they spoke a dialect of Greek called Koine Greek, but listen to what uh, Jim says about it. These original documents that were later translated into in, into uh, in, into Hebrew and uh, uh, into, in, into other languages, um, they were all originally written in what's called Koine Greek. And Koine Greek was was a was a, is an ancient type of, of Greek that is. Uh, that was only written by like very prestigious people, like very uh, uh, wealthy people. Uh, this was not a commoner's language. All right, look, I could take this opportunity to mock him for pronouncing it wrong, but people pronounce words wrong. I'm not going to focus on the fact that he says coin Greek instead of koine Greek. Okay. Maybe, you know what? Maybe that means he's read about it, but hasn't heard about it. And as he's reading, he thinks, you know, K-O-I-N-E. Maybe he just thinks that's pronounced coin. Those mistakes can be made fine. Let's not, let's not get sidetracked by that. Instead, let's look at the claim about the type of Greek. He's saying the Greek in the New Testament is a special kind of Greek, that Koine Greek is a high, like, smart people Greek. Only the rich and wealthy would use this sort of Greek. Well, the University of Texas, Austin, I, I, you see, here's, by the way, this is, the, this is the conundrum I'm in, right? This guy comes, he's got no sources of any kind. <laughs> he makes all these claims. But I realize that if I'm going to reach out to the skeptical community, I need to provide sources and I got to have links and I got to have people I quote because you're not going to take my word for it. But that's fine. Um, here's the sources, right? So the University of Texas at Austin uh, Linguistics Research Center has this article as part of their introduction to New Testament Greek. New Testament Greek, that's Koine Greek. Now this is, I'll put the link in the description for this uh, as well. Um, now... They, uh, they say, uh, the Greek in the New Testament is the so-called Koine, common language Greek. Based originally on the Greek of Athens, it was circulated throughout Alexander the, Great, the Great's empire. What's it called? The common language. It's, the, it's literally the common tongue. In fact, the word Koine, it means it's common. 
That's what it means. Languages acquired by many non-native speakers are generally simplified, as was the Koine. Morphological categories were lost, such as the dual and op the optative, though forms of them may occur in written texts. Sentences were greatly simplified, as noted below, yet many forms remain, especially for verbs. So they just, they're just giving an introduction to you know, Koine Greek. Um, the exact opposite of what he claimed is true. Uh, it's the exact opposite. He's wrong on John. He's wrong on Herod. He's wrong on Greek. Um, and this is what he says, let's see, um, about the ending of Mark. Okay, so let me let me set this one up a little bit. There's only a couple more and then I'll... Uh, actually, I'll go to your guys' questions. Uh, for those of you that are following along live, you can put questions in the chat and I'll have AJ send those to me. I will do a Q&A a little bit here at the end of this. Um, and if, I don't know if, if someone has told Jim, if he'd like to even give feedback and he's in the comments, I'd be happy to, to read what he has to say. Um, I'm not attacking Jim, but I'm very much attacking his ideas that are just very wrong. And he's not a good source for information about the Bible. Um, he's not. So, okay. The ending of Mark, Mark has 16 chapters. The last like 12 verses that are in most Bibles in Mark are generally thought to have been added later by people uh, who were either intentionally or not intentionally adding to the text. Um, this is, I actually have a video on this. I guess I'll link that one too. It's, it, I talk about textual variations. It's kind of complicated stuff. But basically, there's this longer ending of Mark, which we pretty much are convinced was, was made, uh, added to the text. But when you get into the details of it, right? So, so my theology, I don't consider the longer ending of Mark. I just don't consider it in my theology, right? Because I want to have the, the, uh, the, I just want the word of God to guide and direct me and nothing added to it. But listen to what he says about how it happened, because he seems to think there was some sort of Jewish, Jewish council that added these passages 1300 years after the fact. So listen to what uh, Jim says about this. Mark just kind of ends suddenly, uh, I think it's like in um, Mark 13, I think think it is but anyways yeah it just ends suddenly when the women uh go running from from the tomb oh no mark 16 mark 16 8 uh when the the women go go to the tomb and they're scared and they run from the tomb because they're in fear for their lives and mark 16 just ends like that's just just the end of it uh mm -hmm. and but then it, it was later filled in uh to to reflect the other the other gospels by scribes later I, I believe that was done in the 13th century by uh by the the uh the jewish scholars by by that council i don't i i think that's right um okay maybe he's feeling a little a little questioning himself he says i think that's right um okay first off i'll say this uh whenever i hear someone quote the ending of mark and they only quote a, their version of the last verse of Mark and they ignore the whole chapter that the last, you know, eight or nine verses instead of the whole thing. Um, that it's usually because they're trying to set it up so it looks different than it really is. Just go read the, the, the actual ending of Mark and you'll be better off. Uh, so I'll ignore that for the moment being. But the uh, the idea that there was this like Jewish, Jewish, like Jewish? Like that, that in the 1300s that there was a Jewish council that was telling us what was going to be in our Bible? Like, I don't understand this. Um, I Now, maybe he's referring to something I'm not thinking of. That's fine. But here's the deal. We have very early copies from like, you know, a thousand years before what he's talking about, where the ending of Mark is, is in there. It may be that as, as they were reading Mark, they wanted to add content from from Luke, from Acts, and, and what they did was they took the content from Luke and Acts, they just put it onto the end of Mark, so that as you're reading Mark, you go, okay, it doesn't feel like an unfinished story. What happened next? We'll pull from Luke, we'll pull from Acts, we'll pull from maybe Matthew. And so they pulled from these other ones, created, constructed a biblic, biblical, but it's not the Bible, but it was biblical content, uh, and added that onto the ending of Mark, so that as you're doing a public reading of Mark, it's it feels more finished. Um, it may be then that scribes, they're, they're copying Mark and they go, wait, is that, is this commentary on Mark or is this original? So they, they're not sure. So they just keep copying it. They just keep it on there. And that's how it gets added to. Anyway, I get into all this in a different video. It doesn't threaten the authority of scripture. It doesn't threaten, it doesn't tell us that the Bible has been changed over time. That's a misunderstanding. That's an overreaction. Um, but the idea of Jewish scholars adding this a th over a thousand years later is just wrong. It's just wrong. We have early manuscripts that have this this ending. 
a um, couple alternate endings actually. Okay, this uh, this should be fun. We're gonna talk about Christmas trees. <laughs> okay, so Jim gets into the issue of Christmas trees and he seems to think that, I, I think he's confused about the difference between Jeremiah in the Old Testament and what we have in the New Testament. And he's confused about the actual history of Christmas trees. And uh, like some skeptics, he thinks that the stuff he hears about in uh, Christmas songs is stuff that maybe came from the Bible. Um, so I think there's just a lot of confusion going on. But uh, listen into this. He's going to suggest that first century Christians adopted the Christmas tree practice from first century Romans. And then the, the New Testament had text written specifically to tell them not to do that. And nobody listened. So... Uh, here it is. Um, as a matter of fact, that's that's where Christians get their idea of of a Christmas tree. In fact, in the Bible, uh, it says, you know, um, they're they're speaking to to the Romans, uh, the, the the current uh, Roman occupants, and they're 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 saying, hey, if you're a real Christian, you're not going to take that tree into your house and and nail it and uh, and adorn it with silver and gold like the pagans are you because that's not what God wants. And uh, so th that's that's actually where we get the Christmas tree. So I guess that that uh, that speech to the Romans didn't really uh, take hold. I guess people really like their Christmas trees. Could you catch that? His his account of the history of it is you know step one we have pagans that are that do this they do Christmas trees in first century pagan Rome and then step two the Christians trying to mingle with the pagans they start adopting their practices step three New Testament writing appears in response to this saying stop doing this Christmas tree thing and step four it doesn't work the Christians just keep doing it anyways. Um, Let's look at the actual text. There's only one text he could be referring to, and he definitely is because he almost quoted it, but it's Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah, now those of you that know the, know the Bible, you know this. Jeremiah was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And and those who've studied the passage know this. It's not about Christmas trees. Let's, let's read the passage, think we're not in first century Rome. We're not in 20th century, you know, United States either. We're over here in uh, in in a much older time, you know, we're looking, we're looking at, at six, 600 years before Jesus, uh, in Palestine. So Jeremiah, he says in Jeremiah 10 to 10, one, uh, hear the word of the Lord Hear hear the word that the Lord speaks to you. O house of Israel, thus says the Lord, Le learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of heaven because the nations are dismayed at them. So the first step is like, I don't want you to become like the nations. There's things that they do that are that are things I don't like and I don't want you to do them. So I was going to give an example of what that is. Verse three, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an ax by the hands of a craftsman. Now, this is the thing they're going to take this. And a lot of people, even Christians get confused on Jeremiah 10. Every year I get questions about it from people. Jeremiah 10 is not about Christmas trees, guys. Christmas trees didn't exist back then. And if you look at the text... It says, yes, you cut down a tree, but then it's worked with an ax by the hands of a craftsman. In other words, it's shaped into an idol. They, they change the shape of it. You don't work Christmas trees with an ax. You just chop them down, bring them in. Uh, but this is, no, 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 this isn't a, a little Christmas tree. No, this is a tree. You get a big piece of wood, you carve it into an idol. Uh, that's the idea. Verse four, they decorate it with silver and gold. This is not about tinsel and, and, and ornaments. This is about trying to make it look like this, this sort of glorified deity. Um, they fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols, now how could it be more clear that it's about idols, not trees? Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field and they cannot speak for they have to be carried for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. So the idea is God's like, I don't want my people getting involved in idolatry. This Jeremiah passage, sometimes used even by Christians to come against the idea of Christmas trees. Really, the earliest account I know of for Christmas trees goes back, and it's tradition, it may not be true, I don't know. And it goes back to uh, the Reformation and Martin Luther and how he looked out and saw the stars and brought a tree into his house. I don't know if that's true, but... Uh, it's the earliest record I know of for Christmas trees, and I have done some digging on it. It certainly doesn't go back to first century Rome, and it's definitely not in the Bible where that God's telling people not to have Christmas trees because they didn't exist at the time. But Jim's confused, it seems, about the difference between the Old and New Testament, I guess. I don't know. I mean, this is basic stuff. Like, you don't need to be a pro to know this stuff. You don't need to study long to know this stuff. Um, okay, so... Final uh, final clip that I want to 
refute or respond to is his talk about crucifixion. So listen to what he says about crucifixion and listen specifically to what Jim says about how many sources we have uh, for evidence about crucifixion and the, the type of thing that Jesus would have been crucified on and uh, how he knows for certain Jesus was left on the cross, listen, and, and not put in a tomb. Uh, listen to this. Um, the, the Romans, actually, the, the only records that we have of Roman crucifixion, um, they, they, they never took down people from, from the crucifixes. And, and really, the crucifixes were more like uh, straight poles. They were more like trees in which their hands were, were uh, nailed up above their head instead of out, out to the side, as, 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 as we know uh, the, uh, the, the lowercase t to be. Um, but, uh, in, in, in Roman, in Roman crucifixion, they would leave the person to die on the cross and n not just die, but, uh, but to be devoured by, uh, by scavengers. Okay. There's several claims that I want to talk about. One of them is that we've only got one source for information, the source, the only source we have, he didn't go on to say what that source was, but only source implies one source, right? Um, here's the book I'm going to recommend for Jim, uh, to get, or anyone who's interested. This is a book, uh, Martin Hengel. This is like the book for compiling ancient historical sources on the crucifixion. And it just has lots of quotes from ancient historical records to give you information on the crucifixion. We have lots of guys, lots of people from ancient time that actually talked about crucifixion, not just one source. And, uh, he goes on to say that the, uh, that the, the cross was a stake and this comes from the word stauros, which is, that's the word for cross. And the, the root meaning of the word, the etymol, you know, the word etymology, the etymological meaning of the word, that just means like what the word, the word itself, uh, the root of the word means, not what the word means. There's a big difference here actually. Um, but the, the etymology of the word, it means it came from the word stake. Now, the thing is, is that that was hundreds of years earlier, and this seems to have changed. I'll do a video on this one day. It's kind of a complicated issue, but there's something called the etymological fallacy, and it's it's when you when you try to make every word equal the root of the word. Uh, well, the root means this, and therefore it means this, you know. And that's anyway. I'll do a video on that sometime when I get into more detail. But it, even if he was right, even if the cross was a pole instead of a, a lowercase t, that wouldn't matter. Uh, the New Testament, this doesn't relate to the New Testament or even Christianity. It just means, hey guys, the crosses, you're, they're in the wrong shape. Like that's, that, that would be the conclusion if he was right. It's not really relevant. It's just a way of saying, haha, Christians are wrong about the cross. It's, we're not, but that's all it would be. It wouldn't be significant. Um, now the statement he makes about Jesus is that they never took, took people off the cross. They would stay there and rot and the birds would eat them. So there would be no tomb. There'd be no empty tomb. We've actually got, and I've, here's a, a copy of Josephus, right? Josephus is, is one of, uh, the most, the most preserved, you know, uh, authors from the new Testament, new Testament times from the first century who wrote and actually lived around the time of Christ. Uh, and there, and there right after. And he actually wrote Roman non-Christian historian. And so we have his works. It's pretty exciting to be able to have such content. Here's what Josephus says about the idea of crucifixion victims being taken off the cross. And it's in uh, Jewish wars book four, section 317. This translations by William Whiston. And I'll read it to you. Um, oh, by the way, the story leading up to this, you can read it. Just read uh, book four, start around section 300, maybe actually probably 312 or so, and just read on. But Josephus says um, that there's these, the Romans needed more help to put down some Jewish rebellion that was going on in Jerusalem. So they hired in some mercenaries to come in. So these mercenaries come in and they don't do the typical, what Romans typically do. And that causes a problem. So they put down and they kill these Jewish people, but they don't allow them to be buried afterwards. And look at what he says. It's so neat that God has preserved this information of all the things, right? This, he preserved this. He says, nay, they proceeded to that degree of impiety as to cast away their dead bodies without burial, the Jewish bodies without burial. Although the Jews used to take so much care of the burial of men that they took down those that were condemned and crucified and buried them before the going down of the sun. This is Josephus 
he is he's, he's a Roman historian. He's saying that the Romans would allow in Jerusalem the Jews in Jerusalem to take their crucifixion victims off the cross and bury them before the sun went down. It was an it was an exception to the normal rule where they would just leave them up because the Romans were trying. They're not they're not just trying to oppress people. They're trying to create an empire. So they would make some, you know, they they would make some compromises with the people groups they were trying to rule in order to try to create sort of a a sense of submission with those people. So that's in Josephus' Jewish Wars. It specifically mentions an exception to the rule in Jerusalem for the very thing that would actually support the empty tomb. So there we go. There's just another uh, another thing that he just, he just seems unaware of, seems to think there's only one source, doesn't seem to be aware of the content that's here, or at least he's not presenting it that way. Now I got one last clip from Jim that I want to share because this clip I think proves that he is sincere, that he really means what he's saying. Um, so listen in to this clip. Sure, yeah. Uh, guys, thank you so much for uh, for uh, joining the discussion today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I apologize for being a little bit scatterbrained, but there's a lot of good information here. A lot of it's verifiable. Uh, but don't, don't believe me. Uh, don't believe me in anything I say. Don't believe me in what I write in my book. Look for yourself. You want to learn something, you have to read it for yourself. There it is. Um, why does he say that? Um, because I think he's just being honest. He's like, I think I got good information. I'm just sharing it here. We live in a world where information is just like it's always been. There's, you know, for every truth, there's 10 lies. And unless we're thoughtful and careful, we're going to just get the wrong information. Um, the reason why I did this video is because I want to help. I, I, I love atheists, skeptics. I love that community. I want to reach out to them and I want to make a difference. And just like I did my video on Aaron Ra, just like I've done videos on Bart Ehrman, and I did videos on how different skeptics react to the resurrection. I, my goal here is that I, I think this, I think that there's a rational atheist or skeptic that's watching this video. And they're thinking, gosh, you know, some of these people that I, I look up to and that I think are reliable sources, maybe they're not reliable sources. Maybe, maybe I should take a little more seriously the claims of Christians. Maybe I should take a little more thoughtfully the uh, the arguments that they're presenting for their faith um, and that's my hope that's my hope that you'll do that uh, because the because christ is true um and you can tell the information the evidence supports it so i will i will put a bunch of stuff you know he, he gets into uh contradiction vi contradictions in this video as well a bunch of supposed contradictions in the bible i didn't get through that but that's because i have three videos on contradictions and i answer actually the same contradictions he brings up so i'm going to put that in the video description as well i'll put links to the contradiction my videos responding to contradictions and now i'll just say hey um aj if you would uh, take a second and send me any questions people have you guys can put a question in the comments section thanks for joining me i normally do not do live streams on what is today friday on fridays and when i do live streams i don't do i don't do them at this time of day either so you know fair enough um uh it, you know i appreciate we still have over 200 people with us that's pretty exciting uh so okay to your questions uh and it, funny thing about the questions i have zero time i don't know what you're asking i have no time to prepare so um hopefully i'll i'll be able to present thoughtful and useful information to you so first questions from faith wisdom uh who says mike have you considered debating one of the Catholic apologists on Catholic answers, perhaps Tim Staples or Trent Horn? Um, I, I actually, I've done a few like sort of, I've done a few debates now and they haven't been like the really structured sort of real rigorous debates, but we've been moving more structure each time I do one. It seems like we're getting a little more structure there. And I have several debate offers on the table right now, and I'm, I'm interested in actually pursuing more debates. I want to do a lot more debates, to be honest. Um, would I consider it? Absolutely, I would consider it. I just have to space these things way out because a debate requires far more preparation than delivering a message or doing something like what I've done today. Um, a debate requires me to be prepared for everything my opponent might say might say, um, not even to respond to everything they actually say. It requires a lot of work. And so I have to space those things out quite a bit so I can be prepared. But I'm, yeah, I'm interested in that. Very interested in that. Um, uh, question number two from Nick. Nick Kinsman says, uh, Mike, can you please do a video for witnessing to people who claim to be Christians, but are obviously not bearing fruit? Thank you for your ministry. God bless. Uh, yeah, Nick, I will definitely think about it. Like, I mean, maybe it would be a way to put it would be like, uh, I, I'm just thinking like if I put up a video, it was like, Hey, am I a real Christian or, or how to tell if you're really a Christian? I, maybe that would be a, a, a fruitful video. In my experience, 
people who are playing a game that are kind of hypocrites about their Christian faith, it's very hard to get them to recognize it. Uh, it there's almost nothing I can say in my, in my personal experience to get them to turn the light on and realize it. So I feel like those who love the Lord are usually more worried about that than the people who don't, uh, ironically enough. Uh, but I'll definitely consider it. Thanks for the idea, Nick. Um, Bradley Wilcox says, can you ask him about a post or pre-tribulational? Uh, I know it's not the subject today. Um, so, uh, Brad, uh, I think that, um, th okay, so th this is a really narrow scope issue. So pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture that we, you know, for those who might want to get caught up real quick, we believe that there's this, um, I, I'll say, I believe that there is this, uh, there is this literal thousand year reign of Christ that's coming. After the thousand year reign of Christ, we have like the eternal kingdom. Um, heaven kind of comes to earth, so to speak, and the recreation of all things. Um, so, but before the thousand year reign of Christ, I expect there to be the seven year tribulation, seven years of real hard times before Jesus shows up. And at some point in there, there's a rapture. The, the church is caught up together to be with the Lord. Uh, and I believe that will happen. The question is when? Will it happen at the beginning of the tribulation, sometime before it? Um, or will it happen in the middle of it, mid-trib position or post-trib position? My answer is this. I have been raised, uh, at least at least since I was like 19 or so, in a strong pre-trib movement, Calvary Chapel. And so I've always been around this sort of pre-trib movement. But as I looked into my own ability to defend that perspective, I thought, I feel like my ability to defend pre-trib is a little thin. So what I want to do before I teach on it publicly on my online ministry is I want to sit down and do a whole bunch of homework, battle out the issues, and then present a teaching that's thorough. Um, so there, that's why I'm not fully answering your question because I, I haven't vetted my own beliefs on that issue yet. And so I want to vet those before I bring them to you. Uh, Christian Har Harrison says, hi, Mike, my question is what's your dis uh, discretion uh, on Christians having favorites or considering things best or better? Just ask, I just asked because I don't want to be with favoritism, especially with sports. Um, I think it's totally uh, kind of two different categories. So we'll put it this way. Let's say your favorite team is, is the Bulls. Uh, and then you're, you're watching the Bulls and they get a call that goes against the Bulls. And because your favorite team's the Bulls, you have a bias towards them. So you say, oh, that the ref was wrong. The call should have been for the Bulls. Like he was wrong. But your real reason is, your, your favorite team is the Bulls. That's favoritism. Favoritism is I'm, I'm going to treat you unjustly because of my preferences. So it's fine to have a favorite team, but it would be wrong to, just in this analogy, it'd be wrong to, uh, to skew the data, to twist the truth in order to support what you like the best. And the same thing with people. You can be like, I just happen to like that person the best, but you can't treat them differently because of it. You have to be fair with everybody. So favoritism in that sense is about justice and, and equity. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't be like, I love hamburgers the best. Like that is not really related to that issue, in my opinion. Uh, Cam Spires says, uh, for Mike, is the is the massacre of the innocents having occurred or not having occurred a better explanation for the event? I'm sorry, Cam. Cam is, is a super smart guy, but there might have been a typo in, in what you wrote. I'm going to read it again. I don't understand the sentence. Um, Maybe you could retype it real quick for me, Cam, and I'll watch the comments. Um, is the massacre of the innocents having occurred or not having occurred a better explanation for the event isn't in Luke? If not, what is your hypothesis? Why? Oh, why it isn't in Luke? Never mind. You don't have to retype it. I understand. Um, why isn't the massacre of the innocents in Luke? Um, um the, the, the mass, I'm just trying to remember the gospels right now. The massacres it recorded in Matthew, but not in Luke, as I recall. So if, if that's correct, then the issue is why isn't it in Luke? I think the easiest answer is Luke doesn't record every, everything of Jesus's life. I think that's the easiest answer. He's, we, we have, we have multiple examples of where Luke does, does, uh, telescoping or he, he jumps from one moment to another with with no indication of time even passing between the two events he just jumps around which is a normal storytelling technique um that's my honest answer i don't think that this is an issue there's lots of things that are not recorded across the different gospels um it may have not been 
important to Luke to get to the points he was trying to get to. Maybe it was more important to Matthew, who was trying to more make connections to the uh, to the Old Testament and to Old Testament types um, and things like that. So that would be my opinion. Number six, the real effect question. Uh, that's the real effect is the name of the, the YouTube guy. Question for me in in which other video did you cover the topic of Mark and authority of scriptures that are copied? So I have a playlist. If you go to my my YouTube channel, there's a playlist called um, uh, Oh gosh, I'll just I'll just go there real quick. Hopefully this doesn't mess up my internet. Um, oh look, I'm live now on YouTube. That's good to know. There's a playlist on my YouTube channel that has three videos in it that deal with these issues, and it is. Um, about the, the name of the playlist about translations and complex text issues related to the Bible. There's the name of the playlist about translations and complex text issues related text issues related to the Bible. It's three videos and I get into all that in great detail. So you will, you will very much understand the, the issues when you watch that. Um, Ricky Pickering says, Mike, what does it mean in Genesis six, five uh, and the, the, the phrase from Genesis 6, 5 is the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I mean, it, may, it means that man was just exceedingly wicked, that even in the, in the positive things that man was doing, he was just doing evil. Um, is it, is it, the question is, is it hyper hyperbolic or not? Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to even try to answer that right now, but if, if it's hyperbolic, then it's saying men was, incre man was incredibly wicked. Uh, even from his own desires, not just his actions, but his desires too. If it's not hyperbolic, then it, it, it means that mankind, uh, through society, through committing of sins, things it had just gotten so terribly bad that all they were doing was was wicked and evil. Um, now, there now there may be subtext to that question I'm not picking up on, because I'm thinking if, if, if you're approaching from a Calvinist perspective or if you're approaching it from different angles, you might have more follow-up questions, but... Uh, Cam Spires has a couple more questions. One of them is, Mike, who is the best scholar on Herod the Great? Who who argues the massacre is ahistorical? You have read, I, Cam. Honestly, this this sort of thing is just it's silly to me, Cam. Like Cam, I think that what you're doing here, I'll be honest. I think what you're doing is you, you're asking me questions that are meant to try to expose the lack, my lack of in depth reading, and that's fine. I don't, I can't name off the top of my head any scholars that specialize on Herod the Great. Like I don't have a single one. If I want to look into Herod the Great, I go and I read on that topic and I research on that and I look for the data. But if, if you can't tell, like like here's me with Josephus and like here's me with, with Hengel on the crucifixion and here's me with misquoting Jesus. And I just bought, you know, the ancient Near East by Pritchard, which is a collection of, you know, the, the texts themselves. I'm doing my best, buddy. Um, but I feel like you just, you. I feel like you don't want to, I'm being honest with you, Cam, I feel like you don't want to deal with what I'm saying. Instead, you're focused on trying to find things I don't know. Um, but that's not important unless I talk about things I don't know, in which case then it matters. Um, yeah, so next question from Cam. I don't mean that personally, man, but you, you've done this several times to me. I'm noticing a pattern. So uh, number nine, what is the most probable hypothesis of where the author of Matthew got his information about the massacre from? And do we have any evidence for this hypothesis? This is just the same sort of content. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, obviously this is not a Q&A question. This is a question I'm not even interested in, to be honest. Number 10, Fred Bake says, Mike, how can we reconcile or understand the diversity in belief and practice in modern day Christianity when the scripture asks for the unity of the church? Oh, that's an interesting idea. So we have, well, I mean, you know, we have a call for unity. So no matter what the diversity is, I'll just, I'll just, let me put it this way. Diversity is not division. Um, division is division. And I, for one, I have fellowship with people from lots of denominations. And, you know, if you looked at the people who actually watch my YouTube videos, at least the demographics, as far as I can tell, it shows that there's like quite a variety of people from different worldviews, uh, not worldviews, I should say, but different uh, groups within Christianity, within true Christianity. So I, I feel like though we have diversity, we don't necessarily have division, but yet sometimes division rises to the surface. And to that, I just say we have to be reminded um, that we're to, uh, we're to put on love, we're to walk in unity. Um, we're to, we're to be 
seeking to honor Christ, even in our disagreements, even in the things where we don't get along in some sense to overlook that, to overpower that with love and compassion, to be unified in, in the, in the majors and try to have as much grace in the minor issues as we possibly can. I think one thing that happens though, is if I'm raised in a church, I'm always at that church and I learn all the nuanced beliefs of, of, of the leadership, maybe my pastor in particular. And then anybody who believes anything different than that is suspicious to me. And we should, we should overcome that. We should get past that and realize that the, um, there's room for disagreement within Christianity. It's in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to say real quick, Cam, I'm not, I, I'm a, I feel like I was overly harsh with you. I don't mean to be that way with you, man. I really don't. I do think that your, uh, your questions are, are, are meant to achieve something that you're trying to get at and that aren't really about getting, getting information from me, you know, finding out what I know, even as much as trying to achieve some other sort of goal that I don't think is terribly respectable. So, but I don't mean to be, you know, I'm not attacking you in that. So, um, so you guys, this has been my live stream, uh, just surprise live stream on a, on a random Friday. I still plan on doing a video next Tuesday and a lot more, so much more coming up uh, in time to come. So if you haven't subscribed, now's a great chance to subscribe to my channel. You can click the little bell so you can get, oh, I meant to put my little, I have a little, uh, a little graphic someone made for me. I meant to put it up here. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'll hopefully see you guys next Tuesday. Until then, uh, Lord bless you. Keep thinking, think critically. And if you're a skeptic, I encourage you be critical of your criticisms. Be thoughtful of the things that you perhaps maybe you laugh at Christians wrongly. Maybe maybe you're maybe you've become the one who too easily takes in something that's almost like the dogma of your of your worldview. Yeah. Have a great one.